It's pretty easy to go to, uh, from chest pains to heart, right? Like that's especially, I remember going to the doctor once, I had chest pains and it's like, whoa, that's scary. But it was just muscular or whatever they, they were. So hope it's, uh, hopefully it's something like that instead of something more serious. Mark, yeah. your heart is a muscle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it wins with the heart pain. <laughs> ah, whatever you want to say. Skeletal instead of... <laughs> but, uh, oh, why did I take that away? Well, that's fine. So uh, the last, this last week, we've had a good week of the camp. We had a fundraiser on Thursday, had a, uh, quite a few people at camp. And, uh, and then we, yeah, yesterday, we had a group uh, called Inspire Our Nation. Um, and uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of First Nation kids that their, their goal is just to uh, see ki- kids come to know Jesus more and, ins- and be in- inspired to uh, um, t- and have that hope in Jesus as opposed to uh, um, being hopeless. And there was, uh, they told us there was going to be 100 people coming, and they, they came with 120, which is always like, you know, oh, whoops. <laughs> so uh, it, was, it was a good day, and uh, we had enough food, so that's another good thing. I was hoping that John and Sarah was, were going to be here, because uh, one of the, the first things I wanted to talk to is, uh, is the story of the day. Is, I'll get into the story a bit, but a little bit of preamble is in Israel, there's this place called Magdala. And uh, Magdala is, I don't know, Shelly, were you there? Did you go to Magdala at all? Or? Okay, yeah. So it's a very interesting uh, place because it's, or it's, uh, it's the first, there's a first century synagogue there. And it's one of the only first century synagogues that you can, you can actually see. And it's also the place where people believe Mary Magdalene came from, and that's why her name is Mary Magdalene. And uh, there's, there's a, yeah, a big, huge, arch, uh, um, like a, a chapel that has been um, built there. And there's different places that you can just go and, and, and pray. There, the, the big building is called um, Dacanaltum. I'm not sure how to speak Latin, so I'm not exactly sure if that's correct. But it's about talking about lo- being launched into the deep and how Jesus taught a lot from the, the Sea of Galilee on a boat, and, uh, and that we need to go deeper in our life with Jesus and be put out into the deep water. And, uh, they, and so it's, it, they have people from all different denominations coming there, and, and, uh, and, yeah, and, and the, 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 the leaders there, the guides, uh, spend time. Uh, there's volunteers from all over the world that come there, Pentecostals, um, Baptists, um, all types to lead groups and then to lead them in prayer as well. In the bottom of the building, there's this chapel called the Encounter Chapel. And there's this, uh, that, and this is the floor actually of the synagogue that is like the real, from the first century that is on the basement of this building. So right here is, you can, you can actually be walking on the, the, the synagogue floor from first century, which is sort of neat, you know, like that's possibly people, maybe Jesus walked there. More so likely than him walking here, right? So, and it's a, it's a yeah, it's a, an archeological treasure. And then there's this painting here that just sort of like, I, I saw this first in 2016 and I saw it again in 2020. And, and it's the story that we're gonna get into today. But it's, it's, there's the, the painting just brings you into the story. And that's what art, good art does, is it's like, what's, what do they say, a picture is worth a thousand words? Um, and sometimes maybe even more. Um, now this, is, this picture was painted by somebody from Chile. His name is Daniel Cariola. And it's just, it's called Encounter. And it's, the woman that's bleeding, reaching out and touching Jesus. Now, it's interesting, last that you talked about chains, because this is a woman that had chains, and she reached to Jesus, and those chains came off. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that today, too. But this is sort of like, for me, this, this painting, 
Um, and you, and I'm sure on a TV screen, it does, it's not as meaningful as uh, when you see it in person, especially when it like, takes up the whole front room of the, the, of the chapel. But it's somebody who is uh, desperate reaching to Jesus. And transformation happens. So before the story that we're going to get into, Mark 5, 25 to 34, before that, we have um, Jairus um, coming to Jesus. And, Jair, and this is like a little bit before in Matthew, Matthew 5. He is like wanting to uh, have healing for his daughter. So Jesus had just come back from the other side of the Sea of Galilee where the demonized pigs were drowned. If you don't know about that story, look into that too. It's an interesting story. Um, but Jairus now finds Jesus, and, he's, and, he's, and he's, he's a synagogue leader, so he's an important person in Israel. And he finds Jesus, and he's like, you need to come and see my daughter. You need to heal my daughter. So it's an interesting dynamic because you have a Jew who is showing belief in Jesus. So they're like, I think the disciples would probably be pretty excited about that too. Um, so they... They, once, they, once, once that happens, it's like, okay, let's, let's go and see the daughter. Um, Jairus says, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she'll be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. And then there was this disruption. This is from a, from a destitute woman who had suffered for 12 years. And, and Mark this is in both Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or all three of those, those uh, of the Synoptic Gospels have um, this story. They're a little bit, it's a little bit different. In fact, Mark and Luke are very similar. Matthew, it changes the story a little bit. Um, so if you wanted to read the story of Matthew when you get home um, and, and just see how it's a little bit different and, and, and uh, work through that, that would be great too. So this woman was suffering for 12 years. She, had, um, she was bleeding for 12 years. So there's two additional problems with that that came with that. And Mark mentions it. She was completely bankrupt as well. She had spent everything on doctors. She had no money. She was destitute. And the second thing would be that she'd be ritually unclean because she's bleeding. So she's untouchable. In fact, she'd have to yell, unclean, 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 when she's in a crowd of people. And nobody would be able to come close to us. Sort of reminds you of um, COVID a little bit, except for we were all in that together. And I know like, we had to do like, a 10-day isolation or whatever after coming back from Mexico. And that one's that hard, but it's still, like, it still is like, something you don't want to do. But for her, this was 12 years of isolation. 12 years and trying to figure it out with the form of, uh, with the medical attention that she could have at that day and nothing happening. And she had spent all she had and, yet, and she was still unclean and she could not go into the crowds. And she, could, she was very much a destitute. She was physically broken, socially outcast and most likely spiritually hopeless. So that's where she is. And then she's, she knows that Jesus is coming and she thinks, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And then she had that courage to do that. And immediately her bleeding stopped. And she felt in the body that she was freed from her suffering. So that painting there that we have is, where, is that moment that she reached out and touched Jesus' tassel. And that's what, so this thing right here, that's the tassel. And that's what she touched. And she reached out with, and, but she reached out with a lot of uh, faith, right? So a remarkable, a re, this is, yeah, the start of a remarkable story. Then Jesus realizes what, that the power had gone out from him. And he turned to the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? And at that moment, the disciples were like, what the heck, Jesus? Like, you know, you know, Jairus, you know, his daughter, uh, she's needing to be saved. Um, she, he, she's pretty important. Let's get going. That's what maybe some of the thoughts that the disciples were having. 
Uh, they're, they're stuck in the crowd and they need to get to this girl before she dies. So stop asking questions, Jesus, and let's just go. Let's just, let's get to what we need to do. Like how many times are we driven and just, and miss out on opportunities, right? Um, when, and uh, when reading the gospels, uh, you, can't, you, you can't help feel that the disciples are often urgent and Jesus is not. There's a sense of, and, and even like when you come to like believers and, and, and uh, in us, we are often, there's a sense of urgency around us. But with Jesus, there's not as much of a sense of urgency. He was like, this is what John Ortberg says, is that Jesus was often busy, but he was never hurried. Jesus is, and like imagine that day. This is like, he um, was on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, he met this man and that was demon possessed and he drove the demons out of that man into some pigs. They've been flying down uh, into the Sea of Galilee. He jumps in a boat after he talks to the man who wants to come with him and he says, no, stay here. The disciples are probably, they're a little bit scared and they, and they go together across the lake and then they, he jumps out and they so come, come with me to, and he's through this, this crowd of people. Like he's busy. Jesus is doing a lot of stuff. It's a very busy day. It's like we have a fair bit of scripture written from that one day. Yet, he stops. The, the woman's healed. In some ways, there's maybe no need to stop. But he stops. And he addresses the situation. And like I say, the disciples often went against, he, Jesus often went against the, the wishes of his disciples. And like one time he was sleeping in the boat and the disciples did not want him to be sleeping because they were scared. And he fed the 5,000 and the disciples wanted him to all to themselves. They wanted to tell the stories about what happened when he sent them out two by two. And they were like, they were upset that 5,000 people came and joined their party. And they're like, get rid of them. And like, we don't have food. And like Jesus said, yeah, I have food. <laughs> Boom. He fed the 5,000. And like, so there's often times when people are just like, like trying to control Jesus and the disciples, his own people. Even Peter, once it comes to the, the, uh, like the time uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, and uh, well, not Garden of Gethsemane, but when, yeah, when, when, he, when Peter's like, I'm not letting them take Jesus, and he chops the ear off to make sure that, uh, to show that he's up for, for doing something against the priests who are wanting to take Jesus and, and take him to, to, uh, into jail. And, and Jesus healed the ear instead. He spent long moments of pray, in prayer. And I'm sure the disciples, uh, they weren't sure exactly why. And sometimes he even fell asleep. We live in a world that, where there's like strategic plans, there's efficiency, we make sure we have goals, we make sure we have habits that are successful. We even read, read books about seven habits of highly effective people. Not like that's a bad book or anything, but it's like, it gets to us to be like this, we need to like have purpose and goals and get things done. But then let's see how Jesus managed his time. He's got how many years on earth? Like 33. And like three of them were in public ministry, so that's like not even 10% of his years. Like one, out of, one for every 11 years was in public ministry. What was he doing the other 30 years? He was a carpenter. He was spent 30 years being a carpenter before he went into public ministry. And, uh, and there's, there's, um, there's great things that, that carpenters do, but many people would think, why wouldn't you spend more time talking to people? Who did, she, who did Jesus choose to talk to when he, when he walked on this earth? He, cho he chose to, to be with people that were not in leadership, the least in, in, influential people, the bottom of society rather than the movers and shakers. And, and he was among the lower classes. And even then, when he was with people, he still escaped many times to pray. So Jesus was not so focused on the future that he missed what to do in the present. He was not driven to achieve. He was able to give his attention to what his father was doing at each moment and with each person. So he stopped and addressed the woman.
So the woman then, the focus comes back to her. She's like, recognizes that he's talking to her and that he knew what happened and she became very fearful. It's, that's it trembled with fear. And she told him the whole truth. And when we focus on the story, we often think about the desperation of, of, of the woman, which is like that. And that's what I pointed out. Like she was bankrupt. She was destitute. She, but she also had, she, she had tremendous courage. She had tre- tremendous courage that day. Because for her to, to uh, push through a crowd to touch, to touch the, Jesus was, was scandalous. Like she was not saying unclean, unclean, unclean. She was just, she forgot to do that. She just went against the laws. So why do you think she's fearful? She was, went against the laws. And now what's this rabbi going to do to her? A severe p- public punishment? That's what, what in, in, uh, in, for the law of the time, that was the Jewish law at the time, that was what would have happened. She had a low position in society, and now it's going to go even lower. So that's why she was like upset and fearful when Jesus said, who touched my clothes? Yet at the same time, she was still bubbling over like she knew, like she, it would have been interesting because she also knew she was healed. So, so she's like fearful, but she knows there's something here because she was healed. So like, wow. So you're like the most exciting day in your life and you're scared to death. <laughs> Maybe that's the same for you on your birthday when you jumped out of a plane, right? <laughs> Cassidy jumped out of a plane on her birthday, right? So it's pretty scary, right? I not do that. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't compare. But it's like somewhat, like it's exciting, it's something exciting. Sorry, I shouldn't have said it. I, sl- I didn't mean to slam that. But, <laughs> but God, God's kingdom flips the world's values upside down. Oops. I think I accidentally touched this, yeah. Um, the early church called this woman Veronica. Um, because we, we, we know her as a hemorrhaging woman or the bleeding woman, and I think that's why it's easier to call her Veronica than that. It's like a, it's some ways it's a better, it's nicer to have the term Veronica than hemorrhaging woman. Um, but uh, but it's, not, it's not biblically known that her name is Veronica. But she, she had a name. She had a name. She was known to people. And then what was really even significant in this is that Jesus called her daughter. So, to Veronica or whoever her name was, he said, daughter, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. More on that, the fact that he called her daughter in a moment. Now, one other thing about this, so when you're unclean and you touch somebody, you make them unclean in Leviticus law. And now they have to be like, for the rest of the day, they have to be isolated. So the bleeding woman touched the edge of Jesus' clothing, but rather than transmitting her uncleanliness to him, his cleanness was transmitted to her. So Jesus was transmitting instead of her transmitting to him. Not only did the infectious power of impurity have zero effect on Jesus, his own purity overwhelmed and consumed it. And this this guy, Jatani, says, Jesus wasn't merely immune. His presence was a powerful disinfectant. And uh, in today's culture, I don't know if you want to compare Jesus to disinfectant too much, but uh, but it's, it's like... But that righteousness was so powerful and God is there and instead of becoming unclean, she became healed. And this is a theme we find throughout the Gospels. Jesus was not a fearful. He was not fearful. He did not have defensive posture against evil, darkness, and injustice. He broke chains. He did not separate himself from sinners, the unrighteous, He precisely did the opposite. 
Jesus understood that God's love drives out fear as light drives out darkness. He welcomed the sick. He shared his table with sinners and he took himself upon himself the transgressions of all of us. And through Jesus, we discover the kingdom of God is always on offense and not on defense. And he took that moment to be with that, to be with that daughter, that daughter of, that he, that he called her daughter. And then, right after that, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and said, your daughter is dead. And uh, why bother to teach her anymore? And I'm, so it's like, whoa, what happened here? Did he put too much priority on one, one person and then the, do- the, other, the other one died? And then, and the, 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 at the same time, this is the, we know the end of this story. And Jesus went there and raised Jairus' daughter up. And, and uh, Jairus' daughter had life, was raised, to, raised from the dead. At the moment, though, it seemed like it's an interesting thing because the first should be last and the last should be first is what Jesus says later on in Mark 10. And this is sort of what happened is like Jairus in the position he has would have been in theory the first and this daughter of uh, the, this, this woman, Veronica, the, the, the hemorrhaging lady, who Jesus called daughter, would have been seen as last, unclean, not worthy of spending time with. But Jairus' daughter was put into second place, and this woman, Veronica, was put into first. God's kingdom flips the world's values upside down. God's kingdom diminishes what the God's kingdom diminishes what the world rises up. So Jairus, a synagogue leader with high social status, came to Jesus for help. My little girl is dying. But in, and and Jairus was desperate, and he was full of fear. But the status and power he sought. Jesus helped boldly and directly. And Jesus agreed to go with him. So he was going. But then at the same time, he put this other woman in, in, uh, in first over Jairus. He addressed the woman as daughter. And it's also odd that he said daughter because Jesus would have been younger than this woman. So is that, it's not like just, a, just say, saying like, you know how so many people would say, like, son or daughter to somebody that's younger than them. But because she had been dealing with this for 12 years, it's obvious that she was older than, than Jesus. But he was on the way to heal the sinner, or, I mean, to heal the daughter of a synagogue leader. So, so like, he was on his way to heal Jairus' daughter while he was stopped to heal this woman and who he called daughter. There's some power in that. We already know that the bleeding woman was the opposite. She had no advantage and, no, and had been utterly discarded, and yet Jesus prioritized her by stopping healing and blessing her first and elevating her to the identity of being his daughter. So it's as if Jesus was saying, I will come and heal your daughter, Jairus, but I will heal my own daughter, who has been rejected by the world first. So this is subtle, but a powerful reversal. And it doesn't criticize Jairus. He still, his daughter was still like healed. And his daughter came to, back to life. And he was desperate for his daughter's healing, and that did happen. But the, but the hemorrhaging woman, or Veronica, had no one to advocate for her. No one to help her. No one on her side. So Jesus took the time and healed his daughter, prioritized her before the synagogue leader. Because, the kingdom in, his, because in his kingdom, the last shall be first, and the first will be last. Last. 
I think there's two things that we can take away from this story. There's many more than that, but just to mention a couple things about from this story. And one is being fully present with people. And uh, that's what we see Jesus as he was like being, as he, as he was walking and somebody touched his cloak, he was fully present and he didn't take, he, he took time to be with that woman and to like share with her in the healing that just happened. And I think in today's age, being fully present is something that we are less and less. And uh, one thing I realized is like, you know, some, I'm not sure if you guys have earbuds at all or anything like that, but like if you put one earbud in, you're definitely not present to other people. And I, I, remember, I know this because when I walk into the house and, and Candace sees me with one earbud in, she's like, uh, are you like listening to something or are you going to be with me? And, uh, and, that's, and that's, so, so we have, um, we, we need to recognize that at moments that we need to be with the people that are right in front of us and be present with the people that are right in front of us. And Jesus Jesus displayed that over and over and over. He got interrupted many, many times in his ministry, and he chose to be interrupted, and he chose to be with those pe- the people. And I think that's something that we as followers of Jesus need to practice, to, to, uh, to be fully present with the people right in front of us, and to be with the people right in front of us, and to take time with that. I was talking to uh, uh, a friend of mine, and he was just complaining about... Um, it was something in his marriage, and he, and, uh, and and he was saying that he was, you know, it was, it was not none, nothing was his fault, right? And it's sort of like the guy, we guys all often think that, right? For some reason, we're perfect. And like over time, at the end of the conversation, he's like, yeah, yeah, maybe I should maybe follow the advice of my wife and like, you know, um, take my headphones off and not watch the computer for like two hours because he's like every day he he was in this mode of like spending two hours in the evening. Uh, just with headphones over his head, ears and like being, um, being on a TV or being on a computer or whatever while his family was around him. And she had said to him, like, can you please stop doing that? And he said, yeah, maybe I should take my, my wife's advice and stop doing that. And I'm like, yeah, you think? <laughs> like, like, and you're telling me that you're, like having, you're, that you're struggling in your relationship with your wife and you're, you're still doing that, right? Like, and that's, uh, that's an interesting dynamic. And so, so, like, we now, like, that's obvious how we are not fully present. But sometimes we, it's pretty easy to not be fully present um, just by not listening to the person that's in front of us. Uh, just being in a different world. And for some reason, I like to, like, daydream a lot. So, like, I have to really work on this. This is, I'm speaking to me more now than I am almost speaking to anybody else because I need to be, make sure I take time to be fully present with the people that are around me. And it, I think it starts really at, at home, and the people that know you the best are the ones that you may be fully present with the least. So that's, that's, I think that's, this, that's one thing that we can take from this story, how Jesus, he felt the touch of one woman who reached out to him in faith amid the crowd, and he, and he, he stopped, and he, he, he blessed her, and he, he made her feel worthy. He called her daughter. She was scared and fearful. He put her at ease, and he, he, he helped her understand how much he loved her. And everywhere and in every moment, he was fully present with God and others. And that's what life in God's kingdom looks like, is being fully present. So we can practice that more often with the people right around us. And the next thing I think we can do is remember to always focus on Jesus. So that woman was unclean. In that culture, she was unclean, and she was a dangerous person in that culture. And sometimes we can even see the culture as a dangerous environment. And that, so like if we look at at, at this, sometimes we think that the culture infects us, and we need to recognize that we have Jesus, and we need to focus on Jesus, and we need to go to Jesus, and Jesus is, was not infected by that woman, and the culture does not infect Jesus, and we need to go to him first, more so than being fearful of our culture. 
We cannot magnify the power of darkness and minimize the power of God. And, that, and what, what, uh, what Les was mentioning, like this, is, this talks about this, is like we, sometimes we feel in bondage or we feel that we have chains or we feel that we're worried or we have anxiety and it's like we're just not giving it over to Jesus enough. Do we believe that Jesus possesses the authority to cleanse the world, to cleanse our mind, to like give leadership to our life? Do we believe that or do we believe the world possesses um, superior strength to contaminate Jesus? Or do we believe that our circumstances possess superior strength to contaminate Jesus? Simply put, does fear eclipse our faith? Is safety what we want? Is what we want? We can never separate far enough from, uh, from, from things around us. So the only thing that we can do is go to Jesus. And rather than separating ourselves from the world, instead we, should, we need to follow the example of the woman who worked hard to get close to Jesus. And he did, she, she did something that was tenacious to touch Jesus. It's not our isolation from non-Christians that makes us pure, but our, our intimate connection to Christ himself. So we can be out in the world, and we can be doing things in the world, and we can be caring for people in the world, and we, and we need to just draw on our connection to Jesus to do this. Do everything you can to protect your relationship with Jesus. Strive to follow the example of Jesus. He is our king. He is a reason for celebrating. And his kingdom will be, the, in, in his kingdom, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. In his kingdom, Jairus was superseded by Veronica. In his kingdom, we are cared for. In his kingdom, he wants us to come to him his kingdom. He wants us to care for others. Let us pray. God, thank you so much for this, this story of, uh, of a woman who just has the faith to connect with you. Help us to focus on you so that we can care for other people. Help us to spend time, spend time with you this week, being with you, bringing our burdens to you so you can be that chain breaker. Help us to just uh, cast our, all, everything on you and not, not worry about um, the culture around us as much as spending time with you. So that we are, because we know that the culture doesn't impact you. It can impact us, but may our eyes be on you instead. May our eyes be on you instead and be following you and living by your kingdom values. May we spend time understanding your kingdom values by reading our Bible, by praying with one another, by being in fellowship with each other. May we worship you and only you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.